Okay, so I've had the pleasure of introducing Captain Canuck before. And as I've said previously during said introduction, I think it's probably the easiest job in the house tonight. So here's a final fist to five. How many of you have already read tonight's program cover, program from cover to cover? Every hand will go up with a five, right? That's right. People took a lot of time and effort creating those programs. Well, in case you hadn't, I thought I would just cover off a couple of highlights. So, uh, Trevor is the recipient of the Order of BC and the, and the Order of Canada. That kind of means he's like a boss. Uh, he's currently the president of hockey operations with our very own Vancouver Canucks. I'm, nice. I, I'm pretty sure that's a trademarked, um, you know, byline of someone else's, but oh well. I just have to say it's really important, people. Uh, no trade talks tonight. He's a man of integrity. You're not going to get anything out of him. He's already said he's not telling us anything. Many of you know the way in which Trevor Linden has demonstrated leadership on the ice. And we're so happy that through the Trevor Linden Foundation, they're lending a strong voice and a commitment to the youth development programs that enable young people to discover their strengths and realize their potential. When we first met Trevor, we were surprised and delighted with his interest and potential involvement in this work. We figured we had discovered an unlikely ally in Trevor and his team. But instead, what we realize is that he's a very likely ally. He's a thoughtful person, he's a BC parent, and he's a community member. And like many of us, he cares. So without further ado, Trevor Linden. Oh. He's the parent of hockey kids everywhere. Exactly. Well said, Chris. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chris. Um, thanks to First Call, uh, the Vancouver Foundation, for inviting me to join you tonight. Um, this is a real privilege and honor to, uh, to be here, and um, it's great to see some familiar faces from that incredible lunch we had um, at an orchard in downtown Vancouver. Who would have thought this summer that uh, we were at an orchard in downtown Vancouver? Believe it, because I was there. Um, it, was, it was a special day. Um, also, it's, it's really, and just to share um, this night with so many people who care about uh, BC's youth and the families of BC is, is, is really special for me. Also, I have to make note of, of um, some incredible people that I've sat with tonight and um, uh, Cheyenne and Ashley and, and, um, and Meredith. And I want to say something um, that I thought of as I was speaking to Meredith is that a lot of people think of me um, as a hero I've, and, <laughs> and it's quite an honor. Um, I think of and, and I appreciate it. I've taken my role in Vancouver as a, as a hockey player seriously. I've tried to do the right things. Um, I'm not sure that I've had the type of adversity that the three um, young women that I sat with tonight have had. But I want to say, in, in speaking to Meredith, a true hero is someone who battles through adversity and, and comes out the other side and, and is, is determined to be a leader and, and a winner and someone who, who wants to make a change. And that's Meredith, who I sat beside. So you're going to hear from her later. So. We all think about this is about transition, obviously transitioning our young people and giving them an opportunity to be, to, to be successful. And I guess that takes me back to uh, my story again. And, and when people look at me, they think of probably someone who was so lucky. He got to play in the National Hockey League. He got to play in uh, famous cities around North America and these big, uh, big buildings that were sold out and fly on a private uh, plane. And that's all true. I was very lucky, but the, but the biggest stroke of luck I had was growing up in Medicine Hat, Alberta, a tiny little town of 30,000 people. We didn't have a lot, um, but I had two parents that were loving. I had two brothers that were aggravating at times, but uh, we, were, we were close. That's the biggest stroke of luck I had. And um, for a young boy growing up in Medicine Hat, the best day of my life was when um, my mom went to a garage sale and bought me a pair of uh, Phil Esposito 
skates. And I came home as a four-year-old, and they were there, and that was the best day. We didn't have a lot, but we had, um, I had tremendous support. I had tremendous love. Uh, I was given the opportunity um, with, with good mentorship and leadership around me. And, and that, I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. And I recognize that that was a stroke of luck. And, and I'm for, forever thankful for that. I will say that when, um, when I packed up my car as an 18-year-old and I had all my belongings in it and I left Medicine Hat to drive to Vancouver that September of 1988, the look on my mom's face was frightening because she was, she was scared. What is this 18-year-old going to do in that big city in Vancouver? And, and she probably had reason to be concerned. But as we're all here, you talk about the support system that I had as an 18-year-old when I came to Vancouver. And one of those people that was very influential in my life uh, was Pat Quinn. And, and his leadership and mentorship was important to me, but I had support around me. I had good people around me, and that made all the difference to me. I can't imagine, can't imagine being turned loose at that age with with a lack of support and a lack of uh, direction and, and, and mentorship. And, and that's why we're all here tonight. So it's, um, it's, it's special to be here. And, and certainly, um, I, I, I hope my um, stories of, of, of my own personal path, because I can't imagine being a young person and not having that. So it's, uh, it, you know, and it's, I think we have to invest in our young people. If, if we don't, who will? And, and I want to thank everyone in this room tonight because your leadership and, and your being here is showing that BC is willing to stand up for its youth, and that's really important. So thank you for that. Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far here tonight. It's been a, it's been a wonderful night. Uh, the food was amazing. I love Indian food, so that was just fantastic. So, yeah. I th he might be the chef. Are you the chef? No, okay. Yeah. So, um, but I think, I do believe the best is yet to come. So, um, we're going to have the opportunity here for, for some young leaders uh, to hear their stories. And, and I'll let uh, Chris come back up and she can uh, make those introductions. Thank you. Thank you for those words. So it is my pleasure and my honor to stand before you now to introduce three amazing panelists. And I'm going to go alphabetically while they um, make their way up here uh, to tell you a little bit about these three young leaders who are joining us this evening. Ashley Crossin is an artist and an activist. She loves to travel. She really enjoys giving good advice, not just like OK advice, really good advice. Um, and she also enjoys being a grant maker. She's a Love BC alumni. I think there's some of uh, others in the house tonight, as well as a Fostering Change Youth Advisor. Welcome, Ashley. <laughs> Next, we have Cheyenne Andy. She is a VACFAST Youth Advisory Committee member, and she's super passionate about making change for youth in foster care. She loves photography and writing, and she hails from the Newhawk Nation in Bella Coola. And finally, Meredith. Meredith Graham, uh, also known as the smiling face of Douglas College uh, Skytrain ads. You may recognize her from such works. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Uh, so in addition to that fame, she's also a CYC student and she works at St. Leonard's. Uh, she's an amazingly creative wordsmith and a poet. Welcome, everyone. So how this is going to go, there will be a few questions posed kind of by one another and some answering, you know, appropriately. Uh, and so I'm going to hand it off to Trevor. This is like... Um I feel like Larry King right now, that I can, you know, I get to ask questions, tough questions. So, um, okay, so I think uh, my first question is, what skills or relationships do you find yourself needing the most now that you're in your 20s and growing up so fast? Meredith, 
Are you up first? Oh, me first? Yeah. Hello. Testing one, two, three. Hello from the other side. Oh. Hello. Hello. Check one, two. Can you hear me now? I feel like I'm on that Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? How about now? Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's an adventure. <laughs> um, First of all, I just want to express my gratitude uh, for being here. This is an incredible um, opportunity and just uh, looking out at the many <laughs> faces who are here this evening, um, it's encouraging and empowering and all of those wonderful feel-good things and I just want to um, express my gratitude to all of you. So in answer to uh, Mr. Linden's question, uh, one of the things that comes up for me is um, a person who can offer un un unending support, someone to be a champion in my life and to believe in all the things that I do, um, even when they may not be the wisest decisions. <laughs> um, somewhere to fall back on, so someone to catch me when I fall, if I fall, when I fall, let's be real here. Um, <laughs> And uh, for, some, for people to not victimize us, but to celebrate us and everything that we do. Um, you know that old adage, sometimes getting out of bed is a victory, and really sometimes getting out of bed is a victory. So really just acknowledging and celebrating all of those pieces. I think um, a couple of the most important relationships that I have had is, uh, my family and previous social workers because they not only keep me on the right path, but um, they make sure that I have a hard work ethic and a determination to better my future and that's really important for youth these days. Um, for me, it's people you can call on at any time for anything. Like when I've locked myself out of the house at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> So now it's time for me to end. Oh, are you answering? No. Okay. So now it's time for me to ask the next question. So, what would you describe as an essential leadership quality for young people to develop and cultivate? That's for me. Yeah. Right on. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I was fortunate enough to have some really great mentors in my life, and. I mentioned one of them earlier, and that was Pat Quinn, who was uh, the coach and general manager of the Vancouver Canucks when I came here in 1988. And Pat taught me some very valuable lessons. And one of them is, is Pat had this am a amazing ability to care about people. And I think it starts with, 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 with caring about people regardless of their stature. And, and, and Pat was as, as caring and respectful to his number one center as he was to the uh, to the security guard at the door at, uh, at the Old Pacific Coliseum. And that's a sign of leadership. You know, a leader is someone who, who, who recognizes that, that everyone has tremendous value and, and, and I think leaders also continue to try to do the right things. They, they do the right things regardless of the, of the adversity they have. And as I spoke to Meredith and I said to her, which was so impressive is that Leaders don't look for excuses. Leaders don't look at reasons why they, they were dealt a bad hand or they, had a, they got a bad break. Leaders and winners, they look at ways to get better and ways to improve themselves. And that's why when I look at these three girls up here, these three young ladies, excuse me, that's why they're leaders to me. And that's why their stories are, are so incredibly impressive is, is that they're all making a difference in their lives regardless of what they've been through. That's what leadership is about. Leadership is about doing the right thing regardless of who's watching. You know, it's interesting. I, I work with young athletes and, and, um, and, a lot, and they work really hard when I'm around. But I also know, you know, but, I, but, the, but, the, but the real sign of leadership are guys that do the exact same thing day out, day in and day out, regardless of who watching, who's watching. And that's something that for me, um, and I think the last thing I'll say about leadership is that um, leadership isn't about talking, it's about doing. I think the greatest leaders that I played with and that I saw, 
they didn't, they didn't have to say a lot. They didn't have to talk because their actions always spoke louder than their words. And that is a valuable lesson. Um, you don't have to say the right thing, but doing the right thing is probably the most powerful thing you can do as a leader. Thanks, Shrev. Off to Cheyenne. I think uh, important qualities for a leader to have would be to eliminate the fear of being different than everybody else. And when I think about that, I think about the committee that I'm a part of, the Youth Advisory Committee, which is connected to VACFAST. Um, I think about all the committee members on there and knowing that we're all sitting there not afraid to be ourselves, you know, and not afraid to say, voice our opinions and what's important to us and what's, what's not worked for us and what has worked for us. And I think also it's important as a leader to work through and find solutions through the tough situations and not just taking the easy way out. And I think that's really important. It's an important quality for a leader to have. So my answer seems incredibly simple given what um, all of you have offered, but I just think back to elementary school and everything you learned there about being a good person. So. Um, being kind, sharing, being honest, listening to understand instead of listening to respond. So really being in communication with one another and sharing that space and being relentlessly curious. I think leaders are always looking and searching for what can be better, how people can do better um, and getting to know one another because we're, to quote High School Musical, we're all in this together. <laughs> We're all in this together. Um, Keep going. Oh Don't stop. <laughs> oh, I'm going to regret this later. Um, uh, the last two things for me are leaders always um, still consult and seek support regardless of the position they're in. Um, you know, uh, you might be at the bottom, you might be at the top. It's all relative, but it's important to um, communicate and seek um, expertise from other people and to really build each other up. It's really important in the work that especially all of us in the room do to really um, regard each other well and to spend time doing that, I think. Excellent. So the next question is, how do you guys think young people can be supported to offer their leadership around issues impacting youth leaving foster care? Um, so for me, it was really about knowing who you're st having strong adult allies with you and supporting you along the way and having a really strong sense of community. Like, you know, who, like, where's, like, that extended family at? Um, and, like, knowing that people are always on your side, like, knowing that, like, somewhere in a million miles away, there's somebody who's like, yeah, like, you can do that. Nice. Um, for me, it's about getting educated and being interested, uh, coming together to recognize young people as the experts of their own lives and kind of of the system that exists. We have lived it, we know it, we breathed it, sometimes unfortunately. So really seeking um, that strong adult and young person partnership that Ashley was talking about, the, the adult allies. Um, ask us. Um, we can help marry the lived experience with the data and statistics that people are really good at. I am not a numbers person, um, but that's why we all have different skills. So being able to bring those together for the greater good and provide opportunities for us, make space in the same planning and the same committees and what's going on in your lives is going on in our lives. And so really bringing us all together in the same room because we're headed for the, I think the same goal. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, coming together. That's the interesting thing that I found in talking with Mark and Chris when we met, um, you know, a year, actually a couple of years ago, about that they were actually talking to young people and getting, getting, you know, their lot, their story, and that was, you know, so important to figuring out how to make the situation better. So that's interesting. Um, okay, I think that's. Uh, do we have more? Do we have more questions? We have more questions. Oh, I'm not done talking yet. Hello. 
Um, all right, so the question I have, and I also have an answer for it, so I hope that's okay after, but... <laughs> I mean, someone gave me a microphone. <laughs> Sucka! Um, so my question is, what are some ideas for how others might get involved in supporting young people from CARE? And part 2.0 of that is, what might help build momentum for broader public awareness and support? Um, ideas to get involved could include things such as community partnership for the young leaders and um, a way to bring more awareness to the young youth is to do uh, social media, things like Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that. That really catches um, not only the young people but the older people as well as, as they care about us too. Um, I said educating yourselves and about the youth the issues that youth and care face, the challenges they face, and like all the awesome things that they do, and like really challenging the negative stereotypes that you have stuck in your heads. Yeah, that's really important, Ashley. Um, I agree, definitely. Uh, the answers uh, I came up with were to um, do not discredit your impact and your potential on another person. So Mark is probably gonna laugh at me wherever he is, but. Um, I created this term called symphony of resiliency and really it just speaks to um, that we all are an instrument in a young person's life, in everyone's life really, and so not to discredit that uh, potential and that value that you have. Um, you might be the flute in the background or you might be the rock and guitar solo, but you are always feeding into another person's life, so to really recognize that and to um, view that as a luxury and an opportunity um, to be better. Um, to brainstorm solutions instead of rehashing problems. We know stuff doesn't work. We know it. We know it. We've been over it too many times. And so it's time to refocus and bring the good back into light and to really seek solutions forward so that we are getting better as a community and taking care of our young people. And also to not discredit the use of creative voices in, in our lives and in the work that we do. There are, like I said earlier, so many skill sets and so many assets on all different teams, and that's a really powerful way to um, reach people is through the creative arts and the creative media. Um, if I can quickly, there's um, the Ministry of Children Family Development, hold your, hold your judgments, um, is actually where um, they and I are in partnership talking about using one of uh, a spoken word poem that I've written about my experience in care and how, what I just spoke about, the symphony of resiliency, how we're all so important in each other's lives. And uh, one of the lines that came up for me today was, uh, teach me to make a meal, yes, but, teach, but love me enough to believe that I can make that meal and love me enough so that I begin to believe that I'm worthy of that meal. And so I hope, I just share that in hopes that it highlights what is really necessary. You can create policy that impacts that and works mutually, but um, we need to uh, really just value and build each other up. I'm out of questions. Chris, do you have any questions? I'm Larry King Live and I'm out of questions. That's never happened to him, right? One final question. One final question. You've all said so much today, uh, this evening. So one final question would be, um, if you could make one change to really support uh, the future of young people in foster care to reach their highest potential, what would you like to see done differently? Oh, sister, I just want to say it is not fair that you did not prepare us with this question. <laughs> Um, one thing only, oh gosh. I think one of the hugest things is raising the age of children in foster care. We know that, you know, at 19, I might have been 19, but I was also sometimes four and just unable to handle everything that was being thrown at me and knowing that there would have been some extra time and for people to really um, gather and strengthen the community and a per, an individual so that they can come back and be stronger and contribute um, more effectively to um, our greater society is huge. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah. 
I think uh, the one thing that I would like to see change is youth having more um, of a voice, but not only that, but their values held, held high. Um, I think if their values were held at a, a higher level, um, they could talk about things like sibling placement, you know, being together with their siblings, I think is really important for them. It, it can change their life and it, it can impact them in ways that, you know, we might not think about sometimes. And um, <clears throat> it also lets, gives them that opportunity to use their voice more. And I think that's really good for young adults and young leaders. For me, it's letting youth and care participate in everyday activities without all the red tape, like art class, sleepovers, hockey, and basketball. I lied, I have one more thing. I'm sorry, and you did prepare us. I'm the worst student ever. Um, but one of the things is to uh, forgive us because we're doing the best we can with what we have at the time. And so just to recognize that, to recognize that and to um, love us anyway and to support us anyway um, and to build us up anyway because we're already fighting ourselves and we can't fight you too, so. Thank you all so much. A final round of applause for these lovely panelists.